besides reading the presentations, that's very important because I, I didn't introduce all of the presentations posted in week one and besides this article, as you know, you have the first written reflection due tomorrow about cars and their magic. The question, the focal point is, have cars lost their magic? And although it is very much a personal reflection, it is the university version of a personal reflection, right? This is not just your diary, dear diary, this is what I think about my car or my father's car. It is still an intellectual effort. And that is why I recommend that you truly reflect and in order to warm up into the reflection, my suggestion, if you remember there are among other things also suggestions, my suggestion is to review two of, the, of, of, weeks one, of week one's presentations so that you can be alerted to some of the key ideas that would be relevant. And then you can very much add your own ideas, but you have a sense of how your ideas, your reflection aligns with the class. Of course, there is virtually no way you can fail this assignment other than you don't do it at all. Or you repeat the same sentence over and over again. However, if you want to have an excellent grade, then you have to work towards the end of making this a true intellectual reflection, which means you don't need research, but you need to commit some time to the actual reflection, not just start writing and whatever comes when you reach 500 words, you stop and, and it's done, okay? So you can brainstorm, you can jot down ideas and then decide, yeah, I could be talking about this, but I have three more interesting examples and therefore forget about that. And this is one option if you'd rather watch a short film and uh, write about it, then the alternate option would be The Magic of Cars in this particular TV film on a serpentine road with the top down, which can be found on Amazon. And again, even for this, there are suggestions. The style is different. Of course, this is less personal. There is some room for personal remarks, but this is mostly a short film analysis. And it's up to you to decide. Right, as promised, are there any questions at all on the assignments, even things that are not mentioned at all in here? Yes, yes please. Regarding the second assignment. Pardon me? Regarding the other assignment, but the upcoming week, uh, we posting the same problem? Yes, exactly. Every assignment. And then, finally, the final project will be posted inside the same file, which is also the file that I will use to communicate with you about grades, grades for the grade for participation, or uh, the grade for your exam, uh, etc. And the grade for the project together with comments will be posted there as well. So you have one place. Of course, if you've lost the link, if you cannot find it anymore, email me and I'll send you the link back, okay? And I updated the attendance and the files last Friday, if maybe even yesterday morning, quite possibly. However, if you're not there, if you're not in the attendance, if you don't have a file, write to me as soon as possible. Someone had a question over there. Uh, what time is it due tomorrow? It's the end of the day. Yeah, so it should be by, by midnight tomorrow, okay. right? But uh, you're not going to be penalized if you end at 12, 10 a.m. or 1 a.m. Or, or 7 a.m. the next morning, okay? So there is a little bit of leeway. And again, in reference to these written assignments, the the most important thing is if you cannot complete the assignment because you have other assignments or because of the circumstances in your life at that point, 
simply put a comment, put the title of the assignment, and then put a comment saying, Professor, I cannot finish this by tonight, but I'll be done by Friday. I'll be done by Saturday morning. Just indicate a reasonable deadline. I'll be fine with that. Just don't ignore the assignment and without any communication with me, okay? And this applies to this assignment or other assignments later on, which might coincide with your midterms or other heavier assignments in other classes, okay? I'm fine with that. As I said, deadlines for the presentation, the final, uh, the exam are, are stricter, but for these uh, regular, uh, once in a while assignments, flexibility is warranted. What else? Other questions about the assignment? And also clearly, if for some reason, some misunderstanding, a student is completely off on the first assignment, usually I don't put there an F or a D, I'll just say, why don't you revise, reconsider this particular part of the instruction, rewrite, resubmit, okay? The goal is to learn, not to be your policeman or uh, uh, to, to enforce these rules, okay? And in fact, having to redo the work is worse than a bad grade because you, you do have to put in the time and, and the pain associated with the assignment. So write to me if you have other questions about the assignment or post them in the Q&A file. Of course, if you post those questions or if you write to me at 10.30 p.m. tomorrow night, I might not be able to answer, to respond until the next morning. This is week two. The cover image comes from a museum in Maine, near Portland. Very nice museum with about 55, 60 permanent vehicles out of a collection of almost 150 that they have. And I put this here. This is a micro car from the late 1940s or early 50s from Messerschmitt which was more famous for producing fighter jets for the German Air Force during World War II. But after the war, there were one of several autom automotive industries in, uh, or industries altogether in Germany, who went into the production of microcars. BMW was another one. I don't know if you've ever seen the BMW Isetta, uh, because that was one of the preferred modes of transportation in the post-war era for countries that were still undergoing a crisis following the end of the war. And, and the reason I posted this is that when we come to the section where I talk about the future of the car, my thesis is that the future looks a lot like the past, with microcars coming back into fashion, for example. Yep. Yeah, what are microcars? So it would be something that is uh, uh, made for one or two passengers. These days, the standard would be a cost between three thousand and nine thousand dollars, so under ten thousand dollars. So even smaller and cheaper than a smart car made for small, short commutes, and especially for urban areas. And I've provided some examples at the end of the presentation about the future of cars. So uh, I've already posted there a link to a French car because many of, of the examples, there are more examples of this category in Europe or Asia than in here and uh, I will post more in the future. So this is week two, and so we have three presentations about transportation and the history of the automobile. On Thursday, we're going to watch 
more scenes from Herbie the Love Bag from 1968. YouTube videos of this week's lectures will be posted. And these are the assignments, of course, as usual, to review the presentations. These are the same presentations you saw about. Just for practicality, I repeated them here. And you have readings, one for next week. We will next week talk about and analyze passages from this collection of three short stories from the early 1900s. The title of the collection is Araminta and the Automobile, which is also the title of the first of those short stories. I'm not going to go into detail about the history of the automobile. I'm not going to test you on this. So no question in the final exam will be on this article, but it would be ridiculous for any of you not to know the basics about the history of the automobile. And that's why I link to this clear, concise enough given the topic, article on the history of the automobile from the site of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Again, keep in mind, and not only you don't have to focus too much about uh, dates or other details, but in the third of this week's presentations about the future of the automobile, I will offer a recap about the major trends innovations, phenomena in the history of the automotive industry from 1888 until the present time. The written reflection, there are two options. Both, both are based on, on video. Uh, the first option is based on YouTube videos. The other is based on this week's and last week's film. So the first option, the default option, is old cars, new cars, how do they feel? Usual length between 300 and 600 words. And as you can see here, you have to watch at least two videos, one about an older car, and these would be options one, two, and three below, one about a newer car, and those would be options or five or six below. One and one is all you need. You may watch more to get to the video that is most interesting for you in each category. But for the actual writing assignment, you only need one for, per, per group, okay? And the focus is the following, is to observe, summarize, quote, and comment on some relevant content from those videos. What you are going to observe in a video per category about a new car, about an old car, is the kind of reactions that people have to those cars. When they talk about them, when they walk around the car, when they're in the car, what is it they say? How do they act? How do they react, even physically, with their body? And so what is significant? What is the feeling applied to an older car, a newer car? Are there any differences? What are those? And these are the videos with their links. One is from a long series of videos made by Jay Leno and the director of one uh, museum, automobile museum in Newport. There are two in Newport, and, and this is the smaller but more interesting museum and after Jay Leno purchased a, an incredible Great Gatsby like 1920s villa in Newport he's been making uh, more and more videos with the director of the museum so this is one of them and usually they uh, ride and they talk they drive and they talk about one or multiple cars and often they also visit a historic villa or building in the area of Newport. Second one, again Leno and Osborne uh, about a 1904 Mercedes and about the Vanderbilt family 
who were instrumental in the development of uh, the culture of the automobile. You know that William K. Vanderbilt was responsible for creating what highway that you might still be using today. William K. Vanderbilt created on Long Island a really important highway. Yeah. Parkway? Nope. Nope. Is there a Vanderbilt Parkway? Yeah, yeah okay. Nope. Yeah, the Long Island Expressway. And his idea was to have a straight line out of New York, out of Queens, and up to all the way to Riverhead. Why? Because he wanted a modern road where high speed could be achieved because of the quality of the bottom of the road and also a private road where police could not be there to say, you have to drive at 15. He wanted, of course, to make money. You had to pay and introduce toll booths. Uh, of course, when it came to purchasing the land, the availability of land and the demands from some of the landowners forced him to make something like the Long Island Expressway, which goes a little bit in a zigzag line, right? But that is what he did. And he, he was uh, a record setter. He set the speed record a couple of times. He created the Vanderbilt Cup race, which was the first international race in the United States and took place in Long Island, etc. And you have then still for the old car group, a very interesting, again, one of a few hundreds videos created by Jay Leno under, in his channel called Jay Leno's Garage. And these videos, especially the older videos, are much better than the episodes he made then for TV, which are boring, formulaic. In here, he is more original. And I picked something really unique. The Owen Magnetic came late, was not a big success, but what a wonderful, uh, innovative vehicle a hybrid car which would create electricity, would run on electricity, but the electricity would be uh, provided by a, a traditional internal combustion engine. For the new cars feelings section, the options you have are Valentino Balboni, famous test car, test driver for Lamborghini, someone who uh, with limited education, started working in the factory and then uh, was called in to test cars and became one of the greatest professional testers of his time, driving a classic from the 1980s by Lamborghini and telling you about his feelings. And uh, if you want to have a, a better feeling of this, you can read a short article from Jalopnik, which is an automobile blog uh, about this, about what's impressive about the video. In number f under number five, you have Marcus Brownlee, uh, who's, who's more famous for talking about uh, smartphones and such, who's talking, who is also the owner of a Tesla, etc., who's uh, uh, talking about the uh, electric pickup truck from Ford, the Ford 150 Lightning. And finally, you have a, another car collector slash enthusiast, a YouTuber with a lot of followers. It's a big mystery how some people have such a following. Uh, nice guy, but so goofy, so awkward, right? You'll see it right away if you don't know him trying this Ferrari Monza SP2, which is a super exotic uh, Ferrari, meaning a higher level, more expensive, more difficult to drive daily, etc. And again, plenty of reaction of all kinds, uh, voice, sounds, sounds coming from Shmi, uh, and, uh, and words that you can pick from to build your short assignment, okay? And, the assignment is simple. You don't have to go into a complicated structure. Start with anchoring the assignment on examples. So find 
two or three key moments in each video. And, and then you have most of your assignments. Of course, your assignments should be a bullet point list of, of your comments. But once you have two or three key moments, sentences or, or physical reactions or other things you noticed, then you just have to connect them together into a narrative and you're done, okay? And you can find other suggestions. This one is worth three points, okay? For a minimum of 15 that you need. The alternative assignment would be about Herbie the Love Bug and it's called an automotive love story because you may know how the traditional structure used in Hollywood for the longest time still relied upon to this day for many simple movies, romantic comedies, is the following, right? Boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl. Mm -hmm. And that is the same structure of the movie Herbie the Love Bug as you will see on Thursday. So the idea is for you, for this alternate assignment, if you like it, if you prefer it, is to go and find the elements in the narrative arc that connect the relationship between Jim Douglas, the driver, and Herbie, the Volkswagen Beetle, to a kind of romantic love story, including how they meet, how they connect, how they discover their reciprocal feelings, how they lose each other, how they reconnect, okay? And this one is worth four points because it takes more of an effort and the minimum length is likely higher, 400 words, because it's, it's a more complex kind of topic. So that would be it. Any, any questions before I move on? Any questions on the new assignments? Yes, I wanted to ask that like, if we do both assignments, do we get seven points instead of My preference would be that you don't do both when you have an alternate assignment because you would be doubling your efforts pretty much on the same topic but if you feel strongly about that an exception could be allowed email me okay but not in terms of extra points the goal is the same to get with to finish with at least 15 points out of 25 for participation allocated to these assignments it might be more than 15 depending on the assignments you choose you might end up with 16 or 17 which is perfectly fine but still the maximum you will get for participation is 100 or, or 25 points out of your final grade okay other questions okay so Let's talk briefly. Oh, yeah. Uh, for the assignment, since I'm doing a film liner, it might be obvious that I am going to do a first sure. love yeah. like thing. Is that still okay? Yes, it is. No, no, I understand. And that is how I uh, introduced some of these assignments in the past because I had, although a small number, but a few uh, cinema studies or film studies, film and screen studies uh, students. And, and so instead of uh, allowing them to come to me asking for a customized assignment, I introduce them as a, a public category, as a public option. Okay? So go for it. Even, even if you do multiple alternate assignments, that's absolutely fine. No rule against it whatsoever. Okay? Last call for questions of this kind. Okay, let's proceed. So, before we talk about the history of the automobile proper, let's talk about transportation and energy because these two things are connected from the very beginning. And because in order to understand what a revolution the automobile brought about in society, we have to realize how long certain traditional modalities lasted and how long they affected social customs, social structures, etc. okay? I'll try to go fast, but if you, if you want me to slow down, 
or if you want me to proceed more quickly, I can do that. Just let me know, raise your hand and, uh, and, and tell me, okay? Um, I've added a few historical notations because I don't know how versed you, ha you are in the history of uh, past civilizations. They might be too many, those details, or, or not enough, in which case I can explain, clarify. And for each era, I've used the same matrix because we keep our focus on the same point. What sources of energy were used for work, productivity, for transportation, what technical, technological uh, devices or inventions where key had a strategic and critical value for some of past civilizations. What is that those civilizations knew best in terms of technology and energy applied to those categories, work, productivity, transportation. And what is that they knew somewhat, but couldn't really exploit fully, right? Chief example in this case would be steam. The Greeks, realized toys that were moved by steam. Same for uh, the Chinese, but nothing was made really until the 17th century, possibly, or actually the 18th century for which we have evidence, okay? And so we start with the, around the year 3000, after the domestication of courses and the overview for this part of the history of the world is that most societies are moving from foraging into relying more heavily on agriculture they're moving out of a barter system and more and more practicing commerce and there are still plenty of villages but you find more and more larger cities. In fact, when it comes to those cities, factors such as mobility and transportation often affect the choice of a location when the location is intentionally chosen or the degree of success enjoyed by the community built around that city area. So Nineveh, Athens, Alexandria, Rome are all in the vicinity of a river, in the vicinity of, a, of, of the sea, and they, they benefit from uh, those assets. Okay, so once again, we're looking at energy sources, not for heating, but for transportation, for work, for mobility, for productivity in general. And number one for this list, for this era, is humans, right? Humans moving stuff, moving building blocks, moving agricultural tools, plows, moving uh, goods of all kinds, either transporting them on their shoulders, pulling or pushing a cart, etc. okay? And keep in mind that this will be one of the constants because we tend to forget uh, we, we are not a very physical kind of civilization, at least in this part of the world. So we tend to forget how vital human strength was in the transportation of goods or other people well into the 1930s. Okay, so this will remain in effect for the next 5,000 years. It will remain true. Following humans is animals. Why is humans first? Because of course, domestication of animals, especially some of these animals, is a bit difficult. And so the techniques uh, for training uh, and, and full of exploitation of these animals are still uh, being explored during this period. And of course, the animals would be mostly horses and to follow donkeys, mules, camels, if available, oxen, elephants were available, dogs in some instances, 
of course, dogs are used widely, but I'm talking about dogs used for transportation. Water, of course, is a big source of energy. You, you, you have people starting experiments with water mills. Water can be used to uh, move hammers in a blacksmith's uh, shop, and water can be used for transportation of goods upon streams of water or bodies of water, transporting soldiers, humans in general. Of course, fire is also very important as a, a source of energy. In this case, for this period, mostly fire from wood, more rarely from coal or from oil, and of course, wind in combination with water, or sails or windmills, although windmills will develop much more slowly uh, and, and uh, would be the exception during this period. In terms of energy, we have to mention also gravity, right? Or pressure in combination with pressure, because this is what makes irrigation systems or short aqueducts work. Longer aqueducts will come later. The newest ideas for efficiency in the exploitation of energy sources for transportation during this period would be, of course, the will, or better yet, because the will is not enough, you need a combination of will and access, right? Which is a slightly more complicated thing. Anybody can make a will and, and roll it as a toy, but going from there to a cart requires a bit of finesse. And you have carriages of all sorts applied to agriculture and transportation, and clearly from the very beginning you have wills applied to weapons of different kinds, not only mobile attack uh, carriages, but also mobile towers, etc. All kinds of levers, the lever is a simple machine in nature, right? Uh, especially cranes and pulleys are being developed during this period, and one of the most efficient forms of dispensation of energy is the bow and arrow, right? Again, in our modern industrial civilization, we've forgotten how powerful a simple bow and arrow uh, can be. Uh, you, you can ask anthropologists, uh, anthropologists on, this, on this campus, such as Jane Shi, who's written articles, among other things, on how powerful a bow and arrow can be. You can pierce metal right, uh, with bows and arrows. Remember the Battle of Azincourt as, as a, an egregious example of archers defeating armored knights because their uh, uh, bows were so powerful that the arrows could pierce through the armors worn by those knights and kill them, okay? Of course, in terms of strategic relevance of technology, ships wherever available translate into political power, economic and political power, right? The will, second to that, and of course, it, it is strategic whether or not a society civilization from this period is able to domesticate horses and use them alongside other animals. What is known but not exploited, some of the things I mentioned before, coal, uh, oil, steam, wind, also in reference to windmills, which are very rare. Let's jump closer to modernity with one chief example of civilization, the Romans, because their empire ended up encompassing a, a, a large number of territories from Northern Europe to Central to uh, um, the Mediterranean and parts of the Middle East. Of course, it was a very complex society, the most advanced and modern society of antiquity. The economy relied heavily on imperialism, on military expansion, because occupying a new territory for the Romans meant not only to enrich themselves because they retained possession of land, humans, and animals, humans as slaves and animals from any territory they conquered, but they also turned that territory into a market under Roman law. That is the Pax Romana, that is the Roman lifestyle. You do what you want, but you obey Roman laws when it comes to 
politics and the economy, contracts, transactions, justice, etc. Okay? It's a form of proto-capitalism, but also wild uh, capitalism. And the Roman way of life is similar to ours. It's based on consumerism, right? The barbarians wanted to come into the empire, not to conquer the empire, but simply because they wanted to live the Romans' lifestyle, right? They wanted to be like the Romans. They didn't want to replace the Romans. So, energy sources for transportation, nothing much changes, right? Humans, animals, ships, uh, water mills. And there are some newer forms of efficient devices, better use of pulleys in uh, uh, buildings, in architecture, long aqueducts, incredibly long aqueducts. Some of them are still in existence. And not just roads, but a network of road, which is a system of transportation, right? Where you have at regular distances, you have supply depots, you have military security along the way, you have bases where both military units and civilians can resupply, rest, etc. And that's why resilience was the virtue of the Roman military system. They were defeated by many, but only in single battles. They never really lost the war until the very end. Biggest thing is all the ships, right? Pretty much in terms of strategic means of transportation. And what did they know that they couldn't fully exploit? They were very refined in the building, the construction of cogwheels, but they didn't do much with it. And they knew more compared to previous civilization about springs, right? A spring is where you can store energy. And, and therefore, you could think of storing energy in springs and then using it to move carriages, but they didn't do it really and would not be done for the longest period. We jump through the first part of the Middle Ages, we skip that uh, after the collapse of the Roman Empire, we get to the modern era between the year 1000 and the end of the Renaissance or the end of the 17th century. So you have more and more cities, from city-states to big, large capitals of national states. You have a mercantile economy with laws controlling more the labor market than transactions, right? You, you want to keep your workers quiet, not asking for big raises, etc. And you don't want your workers to become competitors if you're an entrepreneur or a merchant. Uh, the commerce, the markets are more globalized, right? And products travel a longer way. So you have a whole uh, series of products traveling from the Far East, from China, from Indonesia uh, into Europe. And of course, you have colonialism as a big thing during that period. So energy sources and technologies again same as before you see you see the pattern you see where i'm going and where i'm driving this at by by saying that the automobile then caused a, quite a big change quite a big paradigm shift now same as before with an emphasis on use of horses and uh, there is a chivalric genre in literature there is a widespread use of cavalry in wars. The ships are becoming bigger ships. They're able to travel longer distances, even though for the most part, ships will not venture too far from the shores, okay? So a ship going from, let's say, Spain to Jerusalem will not travel straight through the Mediterranean. They will follow the coast of Spain, France, Italy, and then the coasts of stay close to Greece, Turkey, and then get to the Middle East, for example, right? Because they're, they're afraid. And that's why later on Columbus became this big explorer because he really went into open sea and for a very long time. Newest ideas for this period are the, some application to the springs to military weapons, 
the catapults, the ballistas, if you don't know, it's, it's a big crossbow. Uh, you, you can click on the link to see one. And, and crossbows, again, crossbows have a lot of energy that is uh, released when, when you pull the, the trigger and, and can be very precise over a short, medium distance. Biggest things during this period are chemical compounds applied to war, right? Flamethrowers and Greek fire for uh, uh, sea battles. Uh, Greek fire would be a concoction. We have an approximate idea of what went into Greek fire, but it was kept a secret for more than a thousand years. But essentially, Greek fire is a concoction that can uh, burn even uh, on the surface of the sea. So you can spray uh, a, uh, an enemy ship with it, and when it catches fire, then it's not easy to extinguish that fire. Gunpowder, of course, will revolutionize slowly at the end of this period, uh, society and the military, and of course, of all the hand, among all the various kinds of guns, big cannons, artillery, uh, are, are the most noteworthy uh, factor. And what is known but not fully exploited, pretty much what I just said. Gunpowder is used, but in a very rough way. And steam, once again, comes out as something that creates a lot of energy, but the applications are toy-like, uh, experimental. Nothing is done with it. And in general, here you have the beginning of chemistry during the 16th century. It's called alchemy initially, it has some magic qualities attached to it, but eventually you, you get to experimenting with explosives, right? Towards the end of this period, a common pattern seen at war is the placement of mines under fortification. Galleries, tunnels are excavated uh, and, and then explosives are placed under the fortification which are blown up and experiments are made with different kinds of gases. And now we come to the industrial era. So 18th and 19th century. We have a financial economy alongside the development of the new industrialized uh, economy. And you have the first attempt at marketing products. The laws for this kind of capitalism focus mostly not on the workers, not on the consumers, but on the big contracts, on fees imposed to imports and exports, and establishing a monopoly that can help you develop your industry. Of course, it's still a period of both colonialism and national wars, and this is part of the hunt for resources. So I go to war to get more resources for my industries. What are the energy sources? Still same as before in a lot of areas, with the addition though of an increased use of coal, steam, because the steam engine is the foundation of the Industrial Revolution, some experiments with oil, some experiments with natural gas. And then more and more of that. Newest act is, number one, the steam engine, then gas lighting during the 19th century, and the use of gas to illuminate houses and streets will change society in a big way, right? People will even change their sleeping patterns because initially the typical sleeping pattern, you can find some recent books about the history of sleep, had this kind of, uh, <coughs> follow this kind of pattern. Uh, people went to rest around sunset, rested or slept a few hours, usually keeping their torso in an upright position, right? When you go see an ancient 
palace, an ancient villa, and you see these small beds, it's not like people were much shorter than we are. Simply, they didn't sleep lying, lying fat. They wanted to sleep in a reclined position with their head high because they thought that breathing would be easy. So people rested, slept for a few hours, woke up, sometimes got up and out of bed, they wrote, they read, and then they went to sleep again. So they had this bimodal sleep. And then, of course, with illumination, people tend to go to bed much later if they, if they can afford it in terms of their work routines. And then try to sleep through the night until the next morning. Electricity changed the world in a big way. We talked about the telegraph during the first class on Tuesday of last week. And electromagnetism in general introduced big innovations such as the creation of electric batteries, which would then be applied even to the automotive industry because electric cars were among the first cars and at the beginning of the history of the automobile occupied a bigger share of the market than they do today. So there were more, by percentage, more electric cars in the year 1900 in New York than there are now, okay, as a percentage of the vehicles circulating in the streets of New York. And then of course, based on the innovation brought by the steam engine, you have trains, you have steamships, and then you have a singular machine that is simple but ingenious, the bicycle. So ingenious that by the end of the century in a number of languages, Italian, French, English offers some examples as well, the machine, la macchina, was the bicycle. Right? And people would say, I left the machine against the wall. Right? And that was, I left the bicycle, I left my bicycle. By, 18, the, by the 1880s, the bicycle was, was developed and refined as an invention, pretty much. There aren't any, innovation, any critical innovation in, in the bicycle after the 1880s. Of course, by now you have complicated gear shifters, right? Or you may have titanium or uh, carbon fiber, but essentially the bicycle is the same. Even the balance of the components is the same because everything in the bicycle is made in such a way that the bicycle is aerodynamic, right? That is easy to keep going and you simply turn the bicycle since it becomes one with your body by leaning into a curve, right? I'm, I'm smiling because we saw two accidents <laughs> at the Electrify Expo, where they had plenty of electric bikes, because people, especially adults, don't know how to ride a bike. In spite of the saying, right? It's like riding a bicycle. The same is true for people like myself who during their first part of their life spent 10 years on a bicycle, right? That was the toy par excellence. I, I wouldn't spend hours of my day in front of a screen, TV or video game, but I would ride my bike for hours a day. In that case, you never forget. Otherwise, you may forget, and we saw two people having accidents. And in one case, there was a security guard who told uh, this lady, lean into it, lean into the curve. She went straight and, and she crashed, uh, no, no consequences, luckily. But again, the bicycle is an incredible machine, it's made for speed, it gives you a powerful feeling of speed and you become one with the machine. So it is similar to the car in that it is an individual device that is connected to your body and to your senses. And by the 1880s, the bicycle took the world by storm. It became a mania. And races with bicycles were very well attended into the 1910s, right? People would go and see the bicycle at the velodromes with those banks, right? With those turns with uh, at an angle uh, and, and 
watching the cyclists go around, watching them have tr terrible uh, accidents as well. Some of those uh, death-defined standmen who were racers by the first decade of the 1900s turned into chauffeurs. So often you find professional drivers who used to be cyclists, especially racing cyclists, okay? But you have people going around the world on a bike, etc. The development of the bicycle was quick. It starts around the early 1800s with the, the dry zine without pedals, goes to the bone shakers and various forms. But again, by the 1890s, the, the project is fully developed. Incidentally, don't believe uh, any document uh, uh, promising that Leonardo da Vinci invented the bicycle. Yes, uh, they can show you a drawing from one of the manuscripts of Leonardo found in the 1960s and 70s, but that is probably, most probably, I believe it, other historians of technologies believe it, is probably a prank. That is to say, that bicycle was inside two pages that were glued together. This Italian scholar, Marinoni, obtained permissions from the friars who owned the manuscript to unglue the pages and open them. Probably in there, he found two circles, which were the beginning of cogwheels that Leonardo often drew. And he himself drew this bicycle, which is very unnatural as an invention, because being the first drawing of a bicycle ever found, you have there the steering bar, the handles, the pedals, the chain, everything is there. It's pro most probably a fake, and then Marinoni a few years later died before he could admit or confess to his prank, but no one, no scholar truly believes that Leonardo invented the bicycle when in fact then another 300 years go by before any attempt at such an invention and the first attempts are much cruder as you would expect. Question. Oh yeah, I was gonna ask like, was the infrastructure uh, uh, okay for using bicycles? It was acceptable because carriages also benefit from a well-paved road. So it was acceptable. It was not perfect. Uh, some courage was required depending on the road you traveled upon. Um, but it was seen as a life-changing kind of individual technology. The best example I can provide is an article from Cesare Lombroso. Cesare Lombroso was a world renowned criminologist, well known even in the United States. His essays from the 1860s, 70s, 80s were translated into English and published in England and the United States right after they came out in Italy. And Lombroso famously wrote an article where he says, well, this invention will multiply crime, will make it much easier for criminals to get an alibi because you can commit a robbery or kill someone, then you ride your bicycle quickly to the other side of the city, you get seen by others on foot, of course, and will testify that there is no way you could have been at the other location murdering or stealing, okay? Uh, he, he was a very materialistic kind of scholar. Lombroso is the same person who went to measure the bodies of the inmates hoping to find the physical characteristics, the bumps in the head, the, the shape of the, of, of the body, of the skeleton, of the bones, that would allow him to identify the natural criminal, the person who's naturally predisposed to becoming a criminal, okay? Oh yeah, I was gonna ask. Yeah. Uh, did uh, people start changing the infrastructure to, for, for bicycles? Not so much. For example, when they invented the train, it started being real. Right. right. And really substantial real. investments were made there yeah. because the train became a fundamental asset for the economy and the military. The Whereas the bicycle was an individual yeah. device for transportation. Yes, later on, 
by the early 1900s, you have entire military units on bicycles. So a, a mobile, a highly mobile unit in a European army before, even before World War One, is a unit with could be a battalion or a company of soldiers all on bicycles and therefore they're able to travel 10, 15 miles instead of three, four miles, which would be normal on foot, three miles, because if you have gear, four miles is already uh, too much for prolonged uh, uh, travel, okay? Okay, so, Of course, the strategic technologies, as you can understand and just mentioned, are the trains, the ships, the steamships, but also the assembly lines. And now, finally, explosives have reached a higher point of development, and you have dynamite, and dynamite can be used to build entire canals, right, or tunnels, and so chemistry changes transportation in big ways. What is known but not really exploited? Hot air balloons, dirigibles, yes, they're practiced, they're experimented with throughout uh, the last part of this period from the 1780s to the uh, uh, end of the 19th century, but they don't change things. They don't really make a dent in, in the area of transportation, mobility, etc. That will happen briefly around the time of World War I, and by the 1930s, the period of dirigibles was over because planes replaced them. Then they came back into fashion, and today they're still used by the military, by some private companies, but it's more of an exotic addition. Mobile artillery, they could make artillery more mobile, they really didn't. Machine guns, they had them, they used them, especially by the end of the war, including the Americans, America's Civil War, but not as much as it happened in the 20th century. And they experimented with automata of different kinds, mechanical automata with cog wheels, right? Think Hugo, if you've seen that nice little movie, but didn't do much with it. Submarines, of course, uh, if you go to New Suffolk on the North Fork, Long Island, you find there the place where they had the first uh, uh, fleet unit of submarines for the American fleet. But, and, and they were used during the Civil War, but they were not really making a difference during that period. They did during 20, the 20th century. And that is pretty much the end because I'll talk about the modern era in reference of to the automobile. But I added this, trying to drive your mind into the initial thinking proposition that is to say there were modalities of transportation that lasted longer than the introduction of the automobile when it came. And we are so used to seeing the automobile as the primary modality for transportation that we've forgotten that even simpler technologies were widely used until just a few generations ago. Okay, so take sailboats. Sailboats were not replaced by steamships right away. Well into the 1910s, you had not only fishermen, but also goods being transported with sailboats, okay? And this is especially true for an area such as the Northeast, including Long Island, where plenty of people work on, on ships, including sail ships. Okay? And you find, sometimes when you go around, you still find recent examples of those big sail ships still in existence. Porters, which is another way of saying humans, right? Humans transporting other humans or goods. Again, pushing a cart, pulling a cart, etc. Widely used, not somewhat used, but widely used around the world until the 1930s. From China to Europe to the United States. Okay, so a large urban area would have large numbers of humans 
who would simply transport heavy goods from one place to another. It could be ice, right? Before free, free, fridge, uh, the, the fridge was invented. It, it could be supplies of different kinds. Horses, as I mentioned last week, well into the 1940s. Even the highly mechanized German army into the war, 1942-1943, relied on horses and carriages for about half of their transportation needs. Okay. But there were plenty of horses, even in the American army, in the British army. Steam train and steamboats were still used in the 1950s on a very wide scale worldwide. And bicycles, widely used into the 1960s as a means of transportation, that is to say, the invention evolved and became more and more popular by the 1960s, millions of people all over the world, tens or hundreds of millions of people, relied on the bicycle to move around on a daily basis. And of course, I've added a last section because a lot of the energy sources that were mentioned before came together within the car, right? Because even a regular, not a hybrid or electric car, but a regular internal combustion engine car needs electricity, needs the chemical refinements that led to the use of rubber, natural rubber first, and then uh, uh, synthetic rubber. You need to control an explosion. You need the advancement of chemistry to control an explosion within the pistons that will release the energy to move the pistons and then that energy is transferred to the wheels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So a lot of those uh, references come back into this section, which you can easily uh, consult by yourself. 